Pastor Nick coming to you from Zephyr Hills First Church of the Nazarene. I'm here inside our chapel building, and uh, I have a, a sermon in our ongoing series on the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. We're looking at the, the world in the day of Jesus, the way that he did things was very specific to that world and yet very relevant to you and me today. So as we go through this, it's going to be uh, a two-year journey with a little break along the way at different points, but we're going to be in the Gospels primarily most of that time. And as we look at the Gospels and as we look at the life of Jesus, my prayer and my hope for you is that these things would uh, relate to your life. Perhaps not every week has something earth-shaking and groundbreaking for you, but my prayer is that uh, through each of these messages, you would hear from the Word of God and that it would build you up and make you useful and ready for service in His kingdom. You see, we're all about serving Christ. We're all about the growth of His kingdom, and I want to equip you for that. Along the way, I'm going to give you different tools, and I'm going to introduce a couple of them to you today that you might be familiar with and you might not. As always, you can go to our website at zfnfamily.org, and you can find uh, different links on there to some of the ministries and things that are going on, devotional guides and things like that that we produce for you. You can find uh, online giving opportunities there or our mailing address. Uh, if you've never been to a service here physically in this building uh, and you want to come, the, the address is on there. You can get in contact with us through that. Also check out our Facebook page. We keep it pretty updated and active with useful stuff for you, so check that out as well. Zephyr Hills First Church of the Nazarene on Facebook. Uh, there's also a tool that you'll find on our website, and also if you dig through our Facebook, you can find a link to it. It's called Right Now Media. Right Now Media is way more content than we could ever make personally or here in this church. And so what it is is it's thousands, of, almost 20,000 videos now, I believe, that are um, just all kinds of teaching, whether it's Bible studies or life helps or uh, things that I love personally is different people and teachers that have gone into the Holy Land and, and searched out archaeological sites and different things that help us understand the world of the Bible. And so we can kind of experience it with them and we can see what it is that was really going on in different stories in scripture. So I invite you to check those things out. I invite you to kind of look at, uh, look at all of our websites and things, but there'll be another one and I'll have a link to it later on the video. It's called The Bible Project. In our live service, I'll be playing that. I can't put it on this video, but your, their content is always free and they're very generous with it. I would even encourage you to support them financially if you have the means. They're a fantastic organization. They're very um, kind of non-denominational as far as their theological stance, so they really don't try to take one side or the other on different things. They just present the Word of God as, um, as wide-ranged as possible to, to the whole group of the Christian community. I really appreciate that crew, uh, the Bible Project, and I use some of their materials quite often. I would suggest them to you as well. You won't be disappointed. Today, now that the commercials are over, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4. We're going to be talking about the baptism of Jesus. I gave a little sneak peek that hit Facebook yesterday that talked about this. I almost forgot what I said because I recorded it on Monday early this week, and I'm not usually that far ahead of the game. So I'd forgotten what I said. I had to go back and re-watch it. And, and, you know, there was one phrase that just that stuck out at me and I talked about it Monday which you saw maybe yesterday and and I, I as I studied throughout the week it kept coming back to me and it's this phrase that Satan said to Jesus if you are the son of God and I can't get that one out of my head and we're going to talk about it in a little bit but first let's read the scripture together Luke chapter 4 starting in verse 1 then Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he endured temptations from the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were completed, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone. 
Then the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in a flash all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, To you I will grant this whole realm and the glory that goes along with it. For it has been relinquished to me, and I can give it to anyone I wish. So then, if you will worship me, all this will be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, You are to worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil brought him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the highest point of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to protect you. And with their hands they will lift you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also said, You are not to put the Lord your God to the test. So when the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him until a more opportune time. One of the things that I always like to do is to look at the context of everything that's going on and see what all is, is happening there. If we've been reading this uh, chronologically or reading through it as if they were events one after the other, and I'll say that sometimes you've got to watch that because especially maybe uh, John and his gospel or some of the other times, the gospel writers are prone to taking certain events out of chronological order, which seems like a problem to us today. I mean, if the news was telling a story and they did that and they started uh, telling things out of order, you'd be like, this isn't good, you know, good journalism. This isn't good newscasting. Why are you guys doing this? But to this, uh, you know, Eastern mindset, first century world, that was fairly common and regular, and the author was allowed to do that to make a point or to teach a certain um, element or aspect. And so it's not a big problem for them, like we might think it would be in our world today for a modern author. But sometimes the, the chronology is hard to figure out. Sometimes it's hard to say, well, this happened, then this happened, and then immediately this happened. Because sometimes it might say, then Jesus, blah, blah, blah. Then Jesus went here. Then Jesus did this. Then Jesus said this. And it could have been days or weeks or months that happened in between those things. And there could have been other events that happened in between. But because of the flow and purpose of what the author was trying to get across to us, he put them right together and said, then he did this. So we're not sure exactly the time frame on this, but I believe it was very tight, very close time frame. As we're looking at what's happening here, it says, Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, I'll stop there and talk about that for just a second. It, it says, then he was, of course, full of the Holy Spirit. And we say, then after what? Like, like what was the event before this? Last Sunday we talked about that, and it's just before it in our scriptures. Uh, here in Luke, it's still in chapter 3, just before it, where it talks about the baptism of Jesus, albeit it's just a few short verses. Matthew gives a much more detailed uh, description of Jesus' baptism, and, and Mark does as well. And so the, um, the, the story, it happened that Jesus came from, we believe, Nazareth to the Jordan River where John was baptizing. And Jesus was baptized there. For more discussion on that, you can go back to last week's message. But Je uh, Jesus was baptized by John and then full of the Holy Spirit. Now, what do we know about that? When Jesus came up out of the water, and I noted last week that he was praying as he was baptized, I had never noticed that before until I was studying this here in Luke as I preached from it. It says that Jesus while he was praying, as he was baptized, the heavens were opened. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Now, I have taken part in the um, launching of the doves or releasing of the doves at the sunrise service at Florida Hospital in Zephyr Hills here for the last several years. And every year we let these, these we, we hold these little doves, about five of us or so, and then release them. And it's, it's a great thing to be able to do. I'm always worried that one of them's going to decide that that's the moment he wants to soil my shoes or, or the suit that I'm wearing or something. I know, wearing a suit, like here I am with my untucked shirt every week, but I do wear a suit from time to time. And so, you know, I'm worried that I'm going to, you know, get that all messed up and have to go to the dry cleaners, but it's never happened yet. Well, this, uh, this bird, as it takes off, it's not just a quiet... 
It's flap, 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 whoosh. You know beyond the shadow of a doubt that that bird has taken off. Even if you couldn't see it, you could tell by the way it sounds. And so I believe when the Holy Spirit came down, it wasn't just a floating, gliding down on Jesus. I believe you heard that sound like a rushing wind. We see that later in Acts chapter 2 when the believers are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And it says a sound like a rushing wind filled the place where they were as the Spirit as they were baptized by the Holy Spirit. I believe when the Spirit manifests himself and, and, and comes down on people that you know it. That there's a life change, a marked difference in the life of that person as the Holy Spirit alights on them and fills their life. And if you haven't had that experience, you should probably be praying that God would give you the fullness of his Holy Spirit. Because through the Spirit of God, we're guided, we're directed, we're shown how to live, we're, we're, we're given the, the stuff we need to fulfill the kingdom work and mission that we have. But Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit now, returned from the Jordan River and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Now, the wilderness could be a couple different places, and we're not sure exactly which one. There's a lot of times where Jesus was going out to wilderness places, and it, sometimes it tells us a little more explicitly, and sometimes it doesn't. Either way, the wilderness signified something for the people of Israel, for the people of God. They, they would spend times in the wilderness because God was using that as a time to meet with them, to commune with them, to teach them something. Oddly enough, many times it happened to be 40, 40 days, 40 years. See, Moses spent 40 days on the mountain twice when he received the law of God and the commandments. Joshua was with him at least one of those times. Uh, Elijah the prophet spent 40 days journeying to meet God, we believe, on that same mountain. Uh, Jesus spent 40 days here fasting, enduring temptations, spending time with God, but also being tempted by Satan. And then throughout the, his ministry, every time that it looks like Jesus is going to get some time to, to be alone in the wilderness, the people find him, the disciples come and, and grab him and say, the people are looking for you. Something happens and his time is cut short. This seems to be a pattern for the life of Jesus, that he would spend time in the wilderness and yet the pressures and cares of this world and even the temptations of Satan would come and attack him. I encourage you to spend time in the wilderness. Whatever that wilderness might be, it signifies time alone with God. And not only that, but the number 40 in our scriptures, and we'll see this in our Revelation study actually tonight, in, as we study that, if you're able to come, great, and if not, I, I'm recording them. It's kind of a low-key recording, but I'm recording it, and I'm happy to send you a link to it. That one isn't going to be made public because, honestly, there's so many people that want to fight about the book of Revelation as if there was a presidential election, you know, as if it's okay to fight about that stuff. But they want to fight about it so much that I'm just not willing to put it out there to, like, everyone. But if you want it, I will give you the link. Just send me an email, and I'll be happy to get it to you. But uh, the, uh, the number 40, we're going to look at numbers tonight, not the book of numbers, but the meaning of different numbers in the book of Revelation and throughout Scripture. But here right now, I'll just give you a little sneak peek on that. 40 days is, or 40 the number, is usually or almost always significant as time that the people of God spend in the presence of God to be equipped by God and then sent by God. It's fitting then that Jesus would do this just before he begins his ministry, just before he calls his disciples, just before embarking on this world-changing, history-changing, eternity-changing ministry that he had, he would spend 40 days in the wilderness, as was the tradition of Moses and Elijah in their 40 days in the wilderness or 40-day journey to the mountain of God. Jesus fasted. Jesus was hungry, it says. You know, this shows his humanity. This shows that Jesus, although he was divine 100%, he was also 100% human. That he couldn't just abide on some superhuman strength and just find some, um, some nourishment that just absorbs through the air. That he was hungry. 
Jesus was just as human and as you and I are, and he experienced the same hunger pangs, the same pains, the same struggles. Like, I'm sure it wasn't easy for him to deny himself food for 40 days. I'm sure it wasn't a simple thing, just like it wouldn't be for you and I. And don't think you could go through a fast that long and still keep up your normal routine of life and the responsibilities you have. No, you have to be committed, you have to be ready, and I believe you would have to be full of the Spirit of God that drove him to do this. I'll also say this. If you're in the wilderness, and, and that might not be like a wild area naturally, which are becoming increasingly harder to find, it seems. But if you're in the wilderness, it's probably because God led you there. And if God has led you there, then he has something for you. If God has led you there, then he has a reason for you to be there. And he has something he wants you to learn. If you find yourself in the wilderness, enjoy that time. Spend that time focused on God. Satan appeared there at the moment of Jesus' hunger, at the moment of, of Jesus' uh, need and, and his, his um, just being famished, or your scriptures might say, Satan comes to him and says, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, take this stone and turn it into bread. I mean, if, if God created the whole world, you can create bread out of a rock, right? No big deal, is it? You've been in the business of creation since the beginning of creation. You've, you've been in the business of, of overriding the laws of nature throughout the entirety of time. Why not this one time take a stone and just make bread out of it? You can eat it and enjoy it. And I would say if Jesus makes bread, it's probably the best bread ever. I don't know. Maybe he was a terrible baker. But Jesus is being, well, I shouldn't say he's being tempted by this because I don't think these were that tempting. I mean, it was, but he was so driven by his purpose and his commitment to his father and to the mission that he had received that this was just an easy one for him. This was like, it's kind of like that, that question they throw in a, a quiz in the middle of it somewhere just to make sure you're paying attention and not circling like things randomly, you know, because you didn't study. Or was that just me? All right, so they, yeah, they put that, that kind of question in there to just see if you're paying attention. And Satan just kind of lobs a softball at him like, hey, why don't you eat some bread? And Jesus is like, nah, I'm good. What does Jesus do? He quotes scripture. He quotes scripture to him from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. And he says, it's written, man does not need to live on bread alone. And he said he was talking of, about Deuteronomy, and that was the story of the life of the people of Israel and how God had fed them manna, which was this bread that came down from heaven and would land on the ground and on the plants, and they would collect it, and they would cook it in different ways and eat it. They had cookbooks that were like 101 ways to cook manna and enjoy it every day with no repeats. I don't know. They probably didn't. But the, the tablets would have been really heavy to turn. Sorry. I'll stop. Uh, so uh, Jesus, um, he was quoting, he was referencing back to that, and he said, you know, we don't live on bread alone. You know, God gave the Israelites manna in the desert for 40 years. 40 years. Jesus gave them bread. Jesus here says, we don't live on just bread, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Later on, uh, in the Gospels, later on in the Gospel of John chapter 4, Jesus is in a Samaritan town. And he's talking with a woman there, and he's sharing the good news with her about who he is. And as he's sharing this with her, as he's talking with her, eventually she goes back into town and starts spreading the good news to all the people that she knows around there. And they start to come out and visit Jesus and meet him. But his disciples had gone into town to buy food. And they brought it back. And they said, Master, eat something. It's lunchtime. You're not doing anything right now. Why don't you eat? I believe that they were facing him because that's how a good disciple does. They face their rabbi, their teacher. And I believe that behind them, Jesus could see, while they were talking about stopping to eat, he could see the townspeople coming back, being led by this woman 
excitedly, hurriedly coming to, to lead them to the source of life. And the disciples were busy worried about a piece of bread. And Jesus said, I see the harvest fields behind you. They're ripe for harvest. He said to them the words, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. And they're thinking, did somebody bring him a sandwich while we were gone? Is that what's going on? And he's like, no, you guys, I'm, I'm talking about yeah, the, the work, the work I have to do, the will of my father. It, it nourishes me. It feeds me. It energizes me. It keeps me going. Jesus understood that his job was more than just to fill his stomach. His job was to provide himself as the bread of life. And so as Satan came to tempt him to turn a rock into bread, Jesus could have said, I am here as the bread of life. Instead, he just simply quoted scripture to Satan and said, nope, I can't do that. Nope, not going to happen. Now, the next thing that happens is that Satan goes and, and takes Jesus, it says, to a high mountain. Now, there were some mountains that were, you know, two, two, three, four thousand feet high. And I don't know if Satan had some, you know, some ability to uh, supersede the laws of nature and just, you know, just kind of like float over there with Jesus. Or if they actually walked there. If, if Satan actually gave him an arm to lean on because Jesus is famished with hunger, and if they actually walked up a mountain, I don't know. I'm using a little bit of imagination here, but I don't want to become a heretic. Heretics are those people that say stuff that's wrong doctrinally against the scriptures, and they get thrown out of the church, just in case you're not aware. I, I don't want to be one of those guys, but uh, I, I'm not sure. I'm trying to imagine what's happening here, but somehow or another, uh, Jesus and Satan are now on top of a mountain. Perhaps Jesus was already nearby a mountain and they just kind of like went to the top hill or something. And it says, in a flash, Satan showed him all of the kingdoms of the world. Now, I don't care how tall that mountain is, you're literally not going to be able to see all the kingdoms of the world. But I have a theory, because of the trade routes that were going nearby, because of the roads that actually connected different portions of the entire known world at that time, that it was possible to, to see the, the caravans of trading going back and forth. And it was possible to see all of the, the cultures and wealth and wares of the world. All the things that they had to sell and to offer were visible in a moment right there. And Satan said that this had been relinquished to him. Now, I don't believe that that was true. As I read through scripture, as I study the entirety of it, God has not relinquished this realm to Satan. However, people have given themselves to Satan. People have uh, just constantly been allying themselves with the work of Satan in this world. The kingdoms and, and, and political structures and economic structures have allied themselves with Satan and they're following him. So Satan at least believed or perceived that this was relinquished to him. And he offered it to Jesus. Now, we'll look in Revelation and, and see this, and, and we'll see it in depth or in detail in a few weeks in our study on Sunday nights at 4. But in Revelation, just the very last verse of chapter 12, and then a couple verses in chapter 13, I want to read to you. And the dragon which, by the way, is a reference to Satan. It's one of the personifications of him, if you will, or the images of him. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads, and on its horns were ten diadem crowns, and on its heads a blasphemous name. Now, the beast that I saw was like a leopard, but his feet was like a bear's, and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. And the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and his authority to rule. Did you, did you catch that part, by the way? It says, the dragon gave his authority to the beast. One of the beast's heads appeared to have been killed, but the lethal wound had been healed. And the whole world followed the beast in amazement. They worshipped the dragon because he had given ruling authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast too, saying, who is like the beast? And who is able to make war against him? 
The beast was given a mouth speaking proud words and blasphemies, and he was permitted to exercise ruling authority for 42 months. 42 months is is one of those numbers, and we'll get into that in a few weeks in our study in Revelation and and so many of the other pictures and images that are in there. Uh, 42 is is the same as three and a half years or 1,260 days, and or 1,360 days, I forget. I'll study that again later. Uh, But it's the same amount of time. It's half of seven years. And in that amount of time, uh, it's, it's, it's not like a time measurement in Revelation. It's a symbolic measurement. We'll talk about this even tonight. You don't just measure a number or a symbol. You weigh them. You, you figure out what's the weight of this number. What's the weight of this symbol? And the weight of 42 or, the, or, of, or of, you know, three and a half years is not just a length of time, but it's saying it's, it's an incomplete thing. There's more that'll happen. It's an incomplete period of time. It's not the end. It's not perfection like the number seven is. It's half of seven. But it's a time where evil is allowed to rule. It it denotes the the, the period of time where it seems like evil is in charge. And Satan believed that he was in charge during these 42 months in which we live. He believed that he was in charge during this time of, um, of, of just him having the relinquishment of authority to him that has been given to him. And it says in Revelation that he gave that authority to the beast. And there's been a lot of discussion about the beast, especially the number that's given to his name. In one simple way of looking at it, the beast is simply the kingdoms of this world. The kingdoms of this world, the rulers of this world, are the beast. And, and, and the, the kingdoms of this world are the ones that derive their power from Satan. He's given them power to be what they are. But he tells Jesus, if you'll just worship me, then it can all be yours. He offered Jesus the opportunity to have uh, the, um, the kingdom without the cross. He offered Jesus the opportunity to at least what Satan was proposing, achieve all of his goals without suffering. And I'll have you know that for Jesus that's impossible, and for the Christian, I would venture that it won't happen for us either. That if you're out there doing the work of the kingdom of God, it won't be without suffering. You will have suffering in your life as you're serving God. Jesus responds yet again from Deuteronomy with that one. And he just simply says, that uh, it's, I believe, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. He says, you must revere the Lord your God and serve him only. It's just a simple quotation from Deuteronomy. He could have said uh, one of the Ten Commandments. He could have said any number of things, but he just quoted from Deuteronomy yet again. What's at stake is the glory of God. What's at stake in Jesus' obedience here or our obedience is that we are to reflect glory back up to God. We're to, to any, any goodness that happens, anything that happens is good, we need to give glory to God for that. And Jesus is not willing to, to part with God's glory. He's not willing to, to toss it away or to give it to Satan or anyone else. He will always reflect that glory back to the Father in heaven. Now, I think so many times in our own life, we don't live this very well. In our prayers, I'm trying to be very careful how I say this because I'll step on some toes, but I don't want to stomp on them. In our prayers, we pray so often selfishly. In our prayers, we pray so often for momentary, temporary things to do with our comfort, to do with our ease in life. So very rarely do we pray for the glory of God in our lives and for the ability to do his will and bring glory to him. What I mean by this is we're more concerned with prayers for healing from a small cold or viral infection or something like that than we are concerned with how can I Glorify God in my life, in all situations, and in all circumstances. We pray that we would 
have safety on a journey or on a, on a car ride somewhere because we don't want to deal with the pain and trauma of loss but not because we know that we have a work to do in his kingdom and we want to continue being able to do that. I challenge you in your prayers to evaluate them. Spend time praying for God's glory. Spend time focusing on living your life for the glory of God. Moving on, third temptation. Satan takes Jesus, it says, to the pinnacle of the temple. Now, if Jesus was in the wilderness that's a little bit to the east of Jerusalem, uh, headed towards Jericho perhaps, there's a possibility that he was there and that that's where the mountain could have been that they went on and now the temple isn't that far away and they walked into Jerusalem and Satan takes him to the top of the temple, to the pinnacle of the temple, which was a place uh, over, you know, on a building on the edge of the wall and it would be where the priest would come and several times a day they would blow the shofar, the ram's horn, that was a, sometimes in your scriptures it's just simply translated as trumpet. He would blow the trumpet to signify the times of prayer. And he would do this also uh, on the Sabbath day. They would call out as the sun was just rising from there. This pinnacle was high enough that they could see the first shreds of sunlight and so they could uh, tell you, they could blow the horn when the Sabbath day was over. But as um, as they uh, as as they would go to this place and they would uh, you know blow the horn from there, Jesus could go up there and Satan said this is very visible. They're looking for uh, for the priest to come here and 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 you know signal the time of the prayer. It'd be very visible place, Jesus, for you to throw yourself down. And now Satan quotes scripture to him. And he quotes from Psalm 90, verses 11 and 12. And he quotes it fairly accurately. The funny thing is, the next verse later in Psalm 90, verse 13, uh, it talks about how uh, somebody would come that would be able to trample on a few things, including a serpent. Which, to me, goes back to Genesis 3, when it was told that uh, the, the, the offspring of Eve would one day crush the serpent's head. It would have been interesting to me if Jesus had come back at him with that scripture. But instead, he goes again to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. He says, you must not put the Lord your God to the test. Because the Israelite people had put God to the test. They had tried to, to, to just see what God would do for them, and they had tried to argue with him, and they pushed back. And it says here that Satan left Jesus for a more opportune time. He left him for the time being. That means he would be back. He would come back over and over again in the life of Jesus. Satan would come back so many times. He would come back and, 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 and tempt Jesus in different ways, and yet every time Jesus would overcome. I believe that Satan, he's like not willing to understand or accept that his fate is sealed, that he is doomed, and that God will eventually bind him forever. <clears throat> in the meantime, in these 42 months in which we live, in this evil age where Satan seems to be allowed to reign and to rule, God is at work. He's working to bring salvation to people. He's working to bring us through temptations to, to strengthen us and solidify us through his spirit empowering us because we have a work and a mission to do and glory to give to God. I want to wrap up with four quick thoughts. If you're in the wilderness, if you're in a place where it seems like it's a spiritual dry time or like you just don't know what's coming next, if you're in the wilderness, it's probably because the Spirit of God has led you there and you need to spend time with Him. You need to spend time in His Word and time in prayer. The second thought I have is that word, if. If you are the Son of God, do this. Now, two parts to that thought. The first thing is that I think we're guilty of this too. We question Jesus. We question God the Father. We say, if you are who you say you are, if you are what it says about you in this book, in this scripture, then why am I going through these things? 
Why, why won't you do something big in my life? Why won't you answer my prayer that I have? The second thing is that I believe Satan challenges us with the same question the way he challenged Jesus. He says, I thought you were a Christian. If you were really a Christian, you wouldn't still struggle with that sin. If you were really a Christian, you would be holier by now, wouldn't you? If you were really a Christian, don't you think God would remove all this pain and all these struggles in your life? Then we end up so many times turning that one back around on God and say, yeah, isn't he right? If I am a Christian, I shouldn't be struggling with this anymore, should I? You need to heal me of this, God. You need to redeem me from this. You need to take away this problem or this addiction. There is a holiness in the struggle. There is a holiness in the, the continual struggle and overcoming of sin and temptation. The world tells us to just cave in and give into it and says you were born this way or this is just how you are and it's all good. Just keep being you. But scripture and, and, and Jesus Christ's example tell us that we are to remain faithful when we've been tempted in these ways. The third thing I want to mention to you, and we just talked about it, is glory. I'll say it this way. Whose glory are you living for? Whose glory uh, is, is your life centered around? Do you look to, to prop, you know, kind of promote yourself or prop yourself up? Or do you work to promote God to your neighbors and to the people in this world? The fourth thing is, do we test God? Now, Jesus quoted the scripture that said, don't put the Lord your God to the test. And he was talking about, you know, quoting this this section of Deuteronomy that the Israelites had done that. But I wonder if we do this sometimes. I wonder if we are guilty of putting God to the test. We'll say things like, God, I will give you my time or my money. I'll set this aside for you if you'll bless me in this way. God, I'll, I'll give you my 10% tithe and I'll even throw in a couple extra bucks just to be on the safe side. I'll, I'll give you that as long as you make sure that I don't struggle financially. Uh, God, I'll, I'll, I'll go and I'll, I'll share the gospel with this person, but as long as I don't feel embarrassed or as long as they don't reject it, I'll keep doing it, Lord. We put God to the test rather than just simply being faithful day in and day out. We say, God, I think you're loving and I think you're powerful. If you are, then show yourself. Prove it. We put God to the test. As I mentioned, I've got one more thing. As I was studying this, as I was preparing this, as I was writing this, I just kept feeling like I was missing like one bigger picture, one big kind of tie up on the whole thing, that it wasn't tied together neatly. And sometimes that's okay. But it seemed like there's one thing I'm missing. And I'm going to leave a link here for you to click on. And I want you to be able to see that. It's a video that the Bible Project has put out, and I talked about it earlier. It's really good. And I love the folks at Bible Project, and I'm thankful that they put this out. But this video just kind of helps sum up what it means to be tested or tempted, and what was going on throughout the entirety of Scripture. And they do it in about six minutes in a way that would take me 30. So I'd encourage you to click on it and watch it. In the meantime... I'm here for you. I know that there's some stuff in here that we all need to work on. And through the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God, I believe he is bringing us to a completion in our faith. That he's bringing us to a place of holiness where we've yielded our entire lives over to God and to his holy and righteous purposes. I would pray that you would find that place in your life where you hunger and thirst for the things of God more than anything else in this world. W would you take some time today to be in prayer and to sh uh, just to, to commune with God and ask where he wants you to go and what he wants you to do? Let me know if there's any way I can help you on this journey to get you where you need to be in Christ. Thanks. Be sure and like and subscribe to our Facebook page and YouTube channel to keep up to date and current with everything that's going on and with all of our video content that we produce for you. I hope you're enjoying this series on Encountering Jesus, a two-year journey through the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. 
If you want to give to the church, I'd encourage you to do that and help to uh, promote the ongoing ministries we have. Here's some options on the screen that how you can do that either online or by sending a text message like I do or sending it in the good old fashioned mail. Whatever you like, be faithful to God in your giving and we appreciate it. And one giving opportunity we have coming up on the 21st is the alabaster offering that we collect a couple times a year. All of this goes to foreign missions. 